Good evening, good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Just one moment, please. Amen, amen. We'll try this again. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at New Beginning Christian Fellowship Church. Amen, amen. amen. We've come to praise the Lord. We've come to exalt His holy name. We've come to give thanks to the God of our salvation. Just join me for a brief moment in exalting the God of our salvation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen, amen, amen. What a wonderful God we serve. Amen. Amen. He is an awesome God. He is a mighty God. And He is a God worthy to be praised. Amen. 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 We hope this day has found you uh, enjoying the, uh, the grace of God. What a beautiful day today. Those of you that have a chance to get outside and to, to uh, take in some of the beauty of the Lord. Maybe you took a walk or... You were just sitting on the patio or your deck or wherever, and just marveling at the, the magnificent God that created the heavens and the earth. Amen? Amen. It, it looks like you could just reach up and touch that sky at times, but we know it's quite, quite a distance from us and we just can't do it, but it is so amazing how he has put everything in his proper place. Amen. 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 So as uh, we come tonight, we come once again to remind you to study the Word of God. One of the reasons that we want to study the Bible is because it equips us to do the work that He has sent us to do. God did not save us unto ourselves. That is, He didn't save us so that we could go about doing whatever it is that we want to do. No, there was a reason for saving us, and He's called us to be witnesses unto him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Amen. So that requires getting into the word, meditating on the word, and praying over the word, and asking the Holy Spirit to help you to uh, hold that word dear to your heart. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to sit at your table, O oh God, to feast upon your word. Father, we realize that we can do nothing until you come. So we invite you into our hearts, dear Lord, to come and speak to our hearts and to our minds, O oh Father God, those things that are dearest to your heart. O oh God, we pray that we would have eyes to see ears to hear, and a heart to understand. So I ask your blessings upon those who are under the sound of my voice, that you would speak to them, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. These things we ask by faith and believe it to be already done. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 So once again, we uh, ask you to Look over your notes from uh, last week. We have those notes uh, typed up and sent out to you by way of uh, email. And I understand somebody may have text that information out to you as well. So uh, there are things that we have in our possession that would help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. I also sent out uh, information asking you to read uh, from the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse five. 
So we'll look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And those of you that had been attending Bible study up until we were asked to uh, stay at home, uh, we were reading uh, on this particular topic, the prayer that, changed the, that turned the world upside down. And it's a model prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And we want to take a look at that on tonight because some of you may not be uh, familiar with that, uh, that book and that study. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And if you have any questions, type them in and they will come up and we will try to entertain those as we go through this study session. Amen? Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 5, and it reads, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Amen. Amen. There is a right motive and a wrong motive for praying. Praying is one of the believer's greatest assets because it takes us into the very presence of God. And God delights in communing with his children. Amen. 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 So then, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to grow in grace and in knowledge by going into prayer. And as we look at these verses, we'll look at verse 5 once again. And it says, and when you pray. What is he saying? Not if you pray, but he's literally saying what? When you pray. You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets. Prayer is something between you and God. There's private prayer, and then there's corporate prayer. And in this case, he's referring to those who are speaking in uh, corporate prayer, public prayer. Now, there's a need for that. Uh, for instance, we just prayed tonight a corporate prayer because we're in your presence. But if we were in alone, then God says there is a place that we are to go enter into where we get rid of what? All distractions. And even when you're praying publicly, there are some things that you can do to offset needless prayers, needless words. Amen. Amen, amen. So the right mo uh, motive for praying is to be heard and to hear what God is saying. Do you believe that? There are times when uh, I arise in the morning and before I begin to do anything, I'll lay there and I'll wait until I feel a move of the Spirit. And sure enough, uh, he comes and he will do exactly what he's called to do. He'll come in comfort. He'll come lead and guide and bring all things to our remembrance. So Tuesday morning, I was lying there and he brought a word to me. And I thought about that word. 
And then later on that day, that word did come to fruition where God will forewarn you of things to come if you will only position yourself in a position where you can hear what he has to say. Now, I want you to turn with me real quick to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Last week, as you're turning to Isaiah 43, last week we were talking about uh, Jesus is your model. He gives us an example of what, how we are to follow him, how we are to come into the knowledge of God, who God is. And so in John chapter 5, Jesus says uh, the work that he had been doing, said the work that was being done had been done by the Father. And now he was doing the work. Amen. So there is work for us to do. He did not save us to be bench warmers. He wants us to be in the game and be what? Impact players. He wants us to be impact players. We want them to have a contribution to the building of the kingdom. So then we look at Isaiah 43 and you say, uh, if you have a chance to read over Isaiah 43, we say we'll begin reading at verse number 10, verses 10, 11, and 12. And it reads, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Now, what is God saying in this passage of Scripture? Allow me to interject some thoughts that I received as I read this in addition to what you may have come up with. One, God is speaking. Did you get that? Verse 8 of that same chapter says, Verse 7 says, Everyone who's called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. God had a, has a purpose for each one of us. And then he says in verse 8, Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. Oh, let them hear and say, it is truth. When we go into prayer, we go in with our to-do list. We go in and we start thanking God for this and we thank God for that. We thank, call out the names of our family members. Thank God for the home that we live in, for the food we have, the clothes on our back, the shoes on our feet. We go down our list, and we can probably repeat that in our sleep because we have said that prayer so much. And then we go on, and we may ask God to give us some things, amen, to do some things. He want us to, uh, we want him to check on somebody else to correct their thoughts, their behavior, because they may be out of line. Am I talking to somebody this evening? Amen, amen, amen. So he says, bring out the blind, bring out those who are deaf. He says, bring them, because people have a, a, a story to tell. And how many people have you run into just in the past few weeks that believe that there is a God and that he's getting our attention? I don't know about you, but I know for a fact that what we are going through now, God has ordained or he has some, uh, 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 submitted that it might come to pass that we he might get our what attention God does not bring evil upon us to destroy us but he allows evil to come so that we can recognize that we are in the wrong place and not doing the right things so he's saying I need some witnesses to stand up and what speak truth and he says in verse 10 who are they you and I Amen? Amen. He's calling us to be witnesses to the things that he has done. 
He says, we are his what? Servants that he has what? Chosen. Now, can't you see someone who's a servant walk into the master's presence and say, look, master, I don't feel like this today. Get Charles to do it. I'm going to take the day off and go golfing. Can you imagine somebody telling God that you're not going to come to work today? You're not going to serve him faithfully today? But how many times have you arisen in the morning and when you began to pray, you asked God, Father, what is it that you would have me to do today? Not always asking him what he can do for you, but what can I do for you, Father? How can I glorify you? He says that he has chosen us that we may come to what? Know and believe. Those are two distinct things. Knowing and believing. You can know of God, but not believe God. Why is that? Because the orders that he gives us, we may not be willing to follow those orders completely. There are some places, as I spoke to you on Sunday, there is a place that he has taken us that we may not really want to go. It's called brokenness. He'll take us up to a place where he needs to break us from self. I heard somebody say that God won't help people who won't help themselves, but he'll help those who will help themselves. I agree with that to a certain extent, but I want to add something to that. God will help those that come to the end of themselves. Amen. Amen. He will come. He will help those who come to the end of themselves. Some people think they can do it all by themselves. Some people think that they know it all by themselves. Everybody else is wrong, but I'm what? I'm right. And that is a dilemma that we find ourselves in today. Because who's listening? God's speaking, but who's listening? So we come to know him not just by our experiences in life, but we come to know God by what? Studying the word of God. Why do we study the word of God? So that we may be what? Fully equipped to do the work of God. For he has given us what? All a work. Your work may be different than the next person's work, but your work is just as significant as anyone else's. Amen? If you are called to be the garbage collector, be the best garbage collector that you can be. If you are called to be a, a scientist, be the greatest scientist that you can be. But whatever you do, do it as unto God. Why? Because nothing of ourselves can glorify God. He gives us the will and the power to do things to glorify him. So if we try to do anything apart from him, then it's vain glory. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. So we have to remember whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord. There comes the what? Believing portion. Knowing it's one thing. But believing is something else. Why? Because to know him, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And to depart from sin from is the beginning of wisdom is to, is to fear God. And departing from evil is understanding. That's how we get understanding. By departing from the things that we've been doing. So he puts a check in our spirit to let us know, hey, that's not the road that I want you to go down today. That's the road of iniquity. You need to check yourself because that will not glorify me. Amen? Amen? So we have a right motive and a wrong motive for praying. And then he says further down, he says, I even I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. My brothers and sisters, when we talk to God, he formed us. He created us and watched over us as we were being formed in our 
mother's belly. He called us forth even before the world was created. He knew us and called us forth before the world was even created. Doesn't that say something about God? What kind of God can have a mind that is so great as to know people even before they are created and brought into the earth? That's mind boggling. That's something to what? To contemplate, to think about. That he formed us and he created us for his glory. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. The wrong motive, going back to uh, my uh, Matthew 6, the wrong motive for praying is to be heard, is to boast ourselves before people. There are some people who, who can pray eloquent prayers. They are able to uh, knock you off your feet with the jargon that they use. But is that impressing God? When a person truly knows who God is, there are two things that are transpiring. One, he knows who God is. And two, he knows that God knows him. Have you ever been in somebody's company and you were talking with them, but they were on their cell phone the whole time you were talking to them? Isn't that rather discouraging doesn't that hurt your feelings that you cannot get their undivided attention? That there's something else that's more important to them at that very moment? And have you ever been talking to somebody and you say something to them and they say, what? Because they really weren't listening to what you're saying? But they heard what you said because in just a split second they'll repeat it. But they said what? Because they didn't what? They said they didn't hear you, but they did. My brothers and sisters, every word that we speak, every thought that we think, everything that we do, God recognizes it. The Bible says we shall give an account for every ungodly word spoken and ungodly deed done. So I admonish you, my brothers and sisters, take note of what you're saying and what you're doing. Be very selective with your words. Amen? Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 27. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 27, and we shall read down to verse 30. And it reads, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand, my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Amen? So this is what verse 27 is saying. My father, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Is there a question? No. All right. When Jesus says that his sheep recognize his voice, that's saying that he's able to what? communicate with them 
Because right now, we know that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Amen? But yet still, he's able to communicate to us. And he says that they recognize his voice. And when you recognize his voice, there's two things that you can do. You can either choose to follow him or you can choose not to follow him. Amen? Amen. Amen. But he is saying that his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. There are people who may come and gather together in a sanctuary, in a study session. And they hear the same thing that you're hearing. But they cannot follow him. Why is it that they can't follow him? They can't follow him because they cannot recognize what he is saying to them, what is in him. And what is in him is eternal life. That's the difference. He came to give us life and life abundantly. But the enemy comes to rob you of that life. So he comes to give you a facsimile of life. But it's not the real life. He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy that which God has established in you. He has given you the ability to hear him so that you can walk in the path of righteousness and not walk in the path of iniquity. Amen? So, with that in mind, he says, they will what? Follow me. Because I give them eternal life. Have you ever been in a store and you walked into that store and you were looking for a particular item and the uh, salesperson may come up to you and say, uh, may I help you? And you know they're going to come up to us real quick. You say, no, I, I'll know it when I see it. And so when you go through the store and you start looking for things, and you don't know exactly what it is that you're looking for. Sometimes we are called compulsive buyers. We got a little money in our pocket. We got to spend it. We don't need anything, but we want to go as what? Spend it. But anyway, we go in and we're walking through the store and you see an item. And when you see it, you say, that's it. Amen. You know it's it. And watch this. Watch this. You're able to get that item and watch this. It's the only one in your size. Oh, talk back to me if you can. Have you ever experienced that? I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. Amen? Amen, somebody. He will lead you in the path that he has chosen for you. But you have to be willing to do what? Follow him. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. He says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Watch this. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, right? Amen. Abundant living is what he came to give us. But then we didn't understand his process of doing that. He had to first come into the earth. He had to take on sinful flesh just as we are so that he could identify with us so that when he died, he died according to the same temptations that we were, what? A afflicted with. He's the only true witness. Did you hear what I said? He's the only true witness because he endured, he saw, he endured, and he kept the Father's commandments perfectly. Amen. Amen. He was able to do that for us. Glory be to God. And then he had to go to the cross in order to do what? To finish the work. Come on, man. Y'all not going to talk back to me. This is. He had to go to the cross to finish the work. And when he had finished the work, he says, it what? It's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the Holy Ghost. What people don't understand, God had to release Jesus from his earthly being so that he could sit at the right hand of the Father and do what? Intercede on our behalf. But not only that, he had to go into the grave. Why? 
He had to die and cover our sin debt so that you died with him. When God sees you, he sees you in the grave. But he doesn't leave you in the grave. He says, my spirit shall not, what? See corruption. So then he has to do something beyond the grave. He has to do the what? The resurrected. Resurrection is greater than life. I'm going to let you feast on that one a minute. Resurrection is greater than life. Because resurrection came and took what? Life unto itself. Because it was what? It was dead. So he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's both. So as he was resurrected, guess what? So were you resurrected with him. So you have this eternal life. You live in another reality. We live in a present reality. What you see, my brothers and sisters, is true. There is a pandemic. It is true. There are people who are falsely accusing you of things. It's true. But there is a reality that is greater than this present reality. It's called a transcendent reality where God abides. He is above earth. He's not bound by, by the laws of nature. He is the law. He created nature. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. In the beginning, there was nothing. And God said, let there be light. His imagination, his faith called light into existence. Amen. There was nothing. He created everything. And don't you know your Father can give you whatever it is that you stand in need of? Amen, somebody. And watch this. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. That's a double security. Oh, I tell you, growing up, I remember my grandmother had about three locks on that door. There was a chain lock. There was the, the, the deadbolt lock. There was the lock that you used, the key. She had, we had skeleton keys back then. And you had to use the skeleton key inside the house to lock the door. Amen. So that was a triple, triple of security. But people still could break into that door. But because God is greater than all, there's nothing or no one that can keep you from your appointed destiny but you. You have to be willing to follow him. You have to be willing to let go of who you were in order to become who you are. And listen to what he says in verse 30. I and my father are one. They are one. They are inseparable. Glory be to God. Amen. And Jesus has prayed that we too would be inseparable. So the things that we have seen the Father do, guess what? He has enabled us to do the same things. But we have to get our mind on the right track in order to be able to do that. So when we go to God, don't think we've got to explain everything to Him. He already knows what we stand in need of. But when we go to Him, go to him humble yourself and say to Him, Father, what would you have me to do today to glorify you? Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen to this. Switch back to Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, verse 6, it says, But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Don't you know that the enemy wants to know what you are saying to God? He says, get into that secret place. And when, now watch this. 
Where you sit will reveal what you see. And what you see will determine what you do. So when you get into the very presence of God, when you are ready to shut out all distractions, God sees that. And what does he do? He puts a hedge around you. Remember what happened when Mary was uh, confronted with uh, uh, Gabriel with the angel? One of the first things he said was, fear not. You see, my brothers and sisters, when we come into the very presence of God, there is an aura about being in God's presence. It's called peace. There's a tranquility. There's no anxiousness there. And you can pour out your heart to him at that very moment. You remember the woman who heard that Jesus was at the Pharisee's house having dinner and she invited herself to the banquet and it says that she came up behind Jesus. She must have pushed her way through the crowd because all the men were around him and she got at his feet which were behind him and she began to weep openly at his feet and the tears ran down and they were so many that she, they were able to wash his feet. She took her hair and she wiped the master's feet. And Jesus called out the Pharisees saying that, yes, you invited me, but you have not done the least thing. And that was to show what? Humility. She was not ashamed to come into the presence of everybody else because once she got into his presence, what? They weren't there. They didn't matter to her. All she knew was she was in the presence of the one who what? Who loved her and did not hold anything, what? Against her. She experienced that just like that. Why? Because it was where she was sitting. She sat in the seat of what? Humility. And before you come, he already knows it. And he prepares a place, what? For you, that you may lay down in green pastures. That was awesome. She knew who he was. And he knew who she was. And he protected her so that she wouldn't feel what? Any condemnation. But when we come into the church, People roll their eyes at us. They talk under their breath about us and sometimes they say it to your face. We need to get out of that. We need to be witnesses to the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we enter into that secret place so that when you enter into that secret place, this is your private prayer. Know this. You are in a place where you are privileged. Because everybody can approach him. It's by faith that you come to him. And he has given you what? The gift of faith. Otherwise you could not what? Approach him. Because a man's faith, watch this will only go as far as he's willing to believe something is possible. And when he believes something is no longer possible, that's as far as he's going to go. So that's why he tells us not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. But your faith gives out because you haven't truly believed in him. Because to believe in him is to say what? All things are possible with him. Amen? So you are in a place of privilege, first of all. Then secondly of all, you are in a place of what? Protection. Somebody say protection. protection. You're in a place of protection because you are valuable to him. Amen? Amen? He's not going to, to allow harm to come in and to snatch you. 
The Bible teaches us about the parable of the sower and the seed. And it says that some fell by the wayside. And that some fell upon stony ground. And that when you get up to leave, the prince of the air, the bird, it comes and what? Steal it right away. See, you can't steal it while you're sitting there because you're in a place of what? Protection. But what you do after that depends upon whether or not you keep that protection or you what? You forsake it. That's why you cannot afford not to study the word of God. Because it's there for a season. And it will germinate if you allow it to get into your heart. And the Holy Spirit will come in and he will begin to, begin to cultivate that seed that is in your heart. That's why some people can, can quote scripture. They can memorize scripture because they have spent time what? Seeking the word of God. And God knew what he had called them for. And they understood their calling. That I must turn my back to the things of this world. And if I remember anything, I must remember what? This word. That's a calling on your life. Are you going to answer it? So you are, this, you are at a point of privilege. And you are at a point of what? Protection. And thirdly, you are in a place of provision. God gives you provision. For the things that you will need. That's why Jesus said when you pray. He said give us this day. Our daily bread. He just doesn't mean. Material things. He means. You need to be fully equipped. To be able to stand. Against the wiles. Of the devil. There's a question. Why does God allow. The faithful to fall. We learn from our mistakes. You see, the falling comes as a result of making a what? Wrong choice. God will not keep you from making choices. He gives you a free will mind. You see, if he chose, he, he, he chose everything, he has given you everything. He has chosen the right path for you. But, he gives you the choice of what receiving it or not. So he allows you to fall. But the Bible says, though a righteous man fall, what? Seven times he shall be what? Helped each time. God will allow you to fall, but he won't leave you what? He won't leave you lying there. Amen? Amen. Amen. The question is, is he protecting us? And, and it's not a complete <laughs> uh, question. I, I don't believe is he protecting us from what? Yes, God is protecting us, my brothers and sisters. And you, once again, you have an appointed day and time. That's why it is so important to whatever the Bible says, whatever your hands find work to do, do it speedily. Because there is no work in the grave where we are going. He has given us an appointed day to come into the earth. And he's given us an appointed day to what? To exit this earth. And while we are here, he keeps a hedge around us till we get to that appointed place and time. But if we choose to do otherwise, to go our own direction, we can forfeit that protection. But once we come to recognize we have forfeited our protection and we repent, now that's the key. You have to recognize that you were what? You were in the wrong. And then when you repent, that means you turn from the direction you were going and you turn back to him. See, a lot of people will say, uh, Lord, forgive me of my sin." But we say that, but what is the sin that you are you have committed and you are confessing? Just to say those words does not get you off the hook. Because he knows the intent and the content of our hearts. So when we repent, that means we turn from and we turn to. So he knows that when we turn to him. Remember the prodigal son? He had everything that he could, he could possibly want. And then he wanted the father to give him his possessions then. 
So father had to give him possession and he allowed him to go out. But he had to take his hand off because he what? He wouldn't listen. And then he had to allow Satan to do what he was going to do to him until he what? He came to his senses. And when he came to his senses, he turned and he came back to the father. They asked the question, well, what about Job? What about Job? Job was a man who feared God and shunned the very appearance of evil. Job had a very special, Job had a very special relationship with God. Job didn't commit a sin. No, he didn't. He did not commit a sin. But what God understood, he knew who the care who Job was the character that was in Job. And he wanted to show the world that God puts a hedge around us because Satan said so. But he said, if you take that hedge away from him, Job will curse you. But God allowed him to be tested because he knew the character that was in him. And he did so knowing that Job had faith and patience to wait on God. He didn't do everything precisely as one would think, but he could not curse God as his wife instructed him to do and die. He couldn't do that. Why? Because he knew that his what? Redeemer lived. And that he would stand at the what? The latter day. Why? All because he had built such a relationship with him prior to the adversity. You see, God allows us to go through adversity. Amen? Amen. Stay with me now because you open up a can of worms and I got to go back there and, and deal with it right now. So turn back to Isaiah 43. Because, see, we don't understand God fully. He allows things to come upon us so that we get to know him. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. It says, but now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. God has purchased you with a price. And he just told you. That no one can snatch him from the Father's hand. Amen. He says, I have called you by your name. You are mine. God has his stamp of approval upon you. Amen. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorched you. My brothers and sisters, I tell you again, there is a greater existence other than this present existence that we are experiencing. It's a transcendent place. It's beyond this universe. It's where God resides. And this is where he has appointed a place for us to be. It's called eternal life. The question comes up, wouldn't it be better for us to say, Father, we repent of our sins, known and unknown, instead of saying, Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our sins like lying and backbiting. My brothers and sisters, uh, as I said before, God knows everything. And when you come to him, you have to come with a what? Sincere heart. You can't play games with God. He knows uh, everything about you. 
even the things that you're going to say before you say them, even the things that you think before you think them. You cannot outsmart God. When you come with an humble spirit, do you not know that there are things you will not be able to utter to him? But the Holy Spirit understands those things. And the Holy Spirit takes those things and he takes them to God. We cannot, they cannot be spoken through the English language. These are things that can only be experienced in the spirit realm. And God knows those things because the Holy Spirit, what? Reveals them to him. And then the Holy, then the Father reveals back to the Holy Spirit so that he can do what? He can comfort you. You see, our minds are constantly turning over and over and we can't shut them off. And because of the way that we have been brought up sometimes and the way that we have formulated opinions, we think it's one way and that's it. But God says, turn it off. Turn your mind off. Give me complete control and I, and I will guide your steps. Amen? Amen. He says, even though you go through this adversity, it will not have the the desired effect that it wants to have upon you. I am not going to be able to get through all of these if I keep entertaining all of these questions, but I want to tell you once again that when you enter into a private, uh, your private prayer with God, you are in a place of privilege, a place of protection, a place of provision, and a place of passion. That's the key. That's one of the key things right there. Passion. God understands you better than you understand yourself. Amen. 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 There's one more question. And uh, it says, is the coronavirus a test for us Christians? Or is he talking and teaching those that go on their own understanding? The coronavirus is is a witness to the world. God says that he's going to do things so that you will come to what? Know him. Going back to Isaiah 43 and 10, he says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. You see, you should have such a relationship with God that God can send you forth and to bear witness to people and to testify to people about the goodness of God. You can't tell people that God sent, God sent this if he didn't tell you that. To say that he did and he didn't tell you that would be presumptuous. But remember, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. He said, if I would send the locusts, if I would send the plagues upon the land, if I would bring drought upon the land, he can do whatever he chooses to get our attention. He says, but if you would, what? Turn back to him. As I have mentioned to you before, my brothers and sisters, there are more church goers than there are worshipers. And God says he's looking for what? The true worshipers to worship him. And we don't have to come to a building to do that. It begins in your home. Amen? Amen? Amen. There are three great rooms for prayer. There are three great rooms for prayer. Amen? So he says, verse 7, When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. There are three great rules for prayer. One, do not use empty repetition. Empty repetition can lead to the following. Heartless praying. We pray out of what? Form. It can also lead to thoughtless Praying. In other words, you're called to pray, 
and your mind is not set on what it is that you want to do. So you are praying and then you try to go back and find something that you have remembered growing up and you try to use those same words for righteousness sake. You might use it and say for righteousness sake, but at the end of prayer, you go back and you say, I don't know what righteousness sake is, but I use that term. So you use terms that you've heard somebody else say. You may pray something that you've heard somebody else pray. But if you have not entered into the secret place with God, and if you have not studied the word of God and allowed the word of God to what? Enlighten you. Then you're only repeating what you've heard someone else say, but he wants you to be what? Sincere with him. So we don't pray ritual prayers. And this is the thing about the Lord's Prayer as we understand according to Matthew uh, 6. It's the model prayer. The Lord's Prayer we know is in John 17. But here what we find is uh, ritual prayer. We have prayed the, the what we call the Lord's Prayer ever since we were old enough to memorize it. And that's what we did. We learned to memorize it. But we didn't learn to pray it. And you think about it. You go to a sporting event. If you participate in sports. Before you go out of the locker room. Or out there on the field to play. You say the Lord's Prayer. Then you went out there and start swearing. You went out there trying to take your. The opposition head off. You knock him down but wouldn't pick him up. You go to funerals. And, and you pray that prayer. Let us pray the prayer that. Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father which art in heaven. And we repeat it. But there are people there who are not what? Understanding what it is that they're seeing. They're not having an interchange with God. And it's not getting any farther than the top of their head. God is not pleased with that. He wants us to be witnesses to who he is. And what he does in a person's life. Only God can change a person's heart. We can change our behavior. But we never can change our heart. Only God, my brothers and sisters, can do that. Secondly, things that can keep us from empty repetition. Have a genuine heart. Knowing God personally. Being able to talk to him without form or fashion. Having daily fellowship with him. Listening to what he has to say before you start what? Battling off what it is that you want to say. Because Isaiah 43 tells us he has what? A lot to say. Then we also must be in preparation. There should be forethought meditating upon his word. When you're in a corporate proceeding and you have been asked to pray, but you're asked to pray before you come up to pray, take the time to meditate on what it is that you're going to pray about before you come up to pray. Because the Bible says, in all thy ways do what? Acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy path. So that the prayer that you pray is going to be what? Meaningful. Amen. See God when you pray. You can't see he doesn't have an image as we have an image. He can manifest himself in any way that he wants to. But when you pray, imagine you are in his what? Presence. Visualize being in his presence. You see, sometimes when a little child has done wrong, they have come to you and they have come with those sheepish eyes. They don't want to look at you directly in the eye because they know what? They were wrong. But how you respond to them will teach them how the Heavenly Father responds to us. Amen? I remember... Uh, teaching beginning swimming and 
the parents would come by the pool, but I would have them, no, you get away, get away from the pool, get as far away from the pool as you can. Because what I'm about to do with these kids, you might show some kind of facial expression. And if they see fear in you, it's going to put fear in them. They aren't going to see fear in me because there is no fear in me. I understand the procedure. They don't, but they have to learn to build a what? Trust with me. So that when something happens and they haven't experienced that before and they jump up out of the water because I'm going to put them under that water and they come up and their eyes are big as a silver dollar. My wide open. But I look at them and I say, yes! And they go, yes! Because that's the expression that's on me. That's the spirit that's on me. And I have to instill that same what? Spirit in them. Amen? So then when you acknowledge him, he prepares you for that which you're about to do. Two, the second rule, do not speak much. Length of prayer has nothing to do with your devotion, but a sincere heart does. Why do some people pray long? Because they think that it makes them look more religious. It makes them feel as though... Uh, 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 God has a special place for them that they can impress people. These things are the wrong motives for what? For praying. Amen? Amen? Because there's nobody greater than God. There's nobody higher than God. Also, ways to prevent the sin that arises from long prayers is control your mouth. Somebody said, put your mind into gear before you put your what? Mouth into motion. Amen. Amen, somebody? Amen. And then think about who God is. As I said before, visualize him. He's all-knowing. We can only see where? To the corner. But he has seen what? Around the corner. Amen. 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 So visualize him. He must know what's going on. So we come to him with sincerity and an open heart. And few words. Somebody said, why can't we say, uh, Lord, forgive me of lying, forgive me of uh, cheating, forgive me of stealing. Certainly those are things that you can acknowledge. But David said, Father, forgive me of what? My presumptuous sins. He said, sins I haven't even what? Committed yet. And he says, forgive me of my secret faults. Amen. Those things that I'm not what? Fully aware of. Amen. Now, some prayers take longer than others. I'm trying to hear up and get this in before eight. We got time? Have we got time? Okay. We good then. We still rolling. We still rolling. All right. Now, here's the thing that some prayers take longer to pray than other prayers. And the reason for that is because these are private prayers, not necessarily corporate prayers. But you remember uh, uh, Jacob, the night that he wrestled with God? The Bible says it was evening time when he went in to pray, and that it was at the break of day, and the Lord said, let me go. But Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you what? You bless me. So he prayed through the night because what he was needing he says, God, you got to give me this because he feared for his what? His family. So there are some nights you have to wrestle with God because there are some things that are going on that you don't want to deal with. But he wants you to what? To come to the truth about these things. That you still got some what? Some malice in your heart. You still got some what? So uh, 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 evil things to some. He knows already what you want to do. Amen. Then remember, Jesus prayed in the mountain. After they had fed the 5,000, he sent them off. And he told the disciples to go to the other side of the, of the lake, right? So they got in their boat and they started going to the other side. But Jesus went up into the mountain to pray. Jesus went up into the mountain. And I believe he went up there and what? He prayed up a storm so that he could test them. Because they had just had a, a mountaintop experience. But he had to bring them back down to what? Reality. So some prayers take all night. Then Jesus prayed in the garden just before he was what? Crucified. 
So there are some prayers that take longer than others. You can't put God in a box. But I hope that we understand, my brothers and sisters, when we pray, there is a model that if we would go back and look at it and study it carefully, God will open up new things. And third, trust God. Trust God with everything, with all your heart, mind, and soul. Confide in Him. Uh, Proverbs 16 and 1 says that uh, the thoughts of a man are in his heart. It says the preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. See, we want to have an agenda, and then we want God to agree with it. But we need to have God's agreement before we even set it into motion. God, is this what you would have me to do? Pray like everything depends upon God and work like everything depends upon you. When we do this, then my brothers and sisters, we will be able to develop a greater what? Trust with God. Amen. Amen. The question comes is coming in, when you have a relationship with the Lord, doesn't he give you the words to say? According to the need, according to the need of his people, when you have a right relationship with God, God will direct your thoughts. The Bible says, commit your ways unto the Lord, and your what? Your thoughts will be established. See, that's how you know that you're in a right relationship with him. You begin to pray in a manner in which he would say, not my will, but God, your will be done. That is so important. So it takes commitment. But if you're not willing to commit, you can ramble and you can miss the mark. But when you begin to seek the face of God for the people of God, he will allow you to see those things that are what? That are important to him. And one of the things that I, was, uh, I had mentioned to you about New Beginning was that we were talking about wanting to start new uh, ministries. And I said, it's strange that no one has mentioned the ministry of intercessory prayer. That is a great need that we have in every body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, I see my brothers and sisters, the times are up. We're not going to be able to go through all of that what we wanted to do, but we thank and uh, praise God for your patience with us on tonight. And we pray that something has been said that will help to edify you, that will bring glory to God. And strengthen our walk with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us close with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to feast at your table. We thank you, O oh God, for what our ears have heard on this evening, O oh Father God, and what our hearts have felt. Father God, we realize, O oh Lord, that one may sow and another may water. But God, you bring forth the increase. So I thank you, Holy Spirit for bearing witness to the truth of your word, O oh Lord, and bringing it to fruition in the lives of those who have come to hear. Bless us, O oh God, and keep us is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good night.